Greetings, hillside friends and family. What a joy to come here this morning and uh, open God's Word with you. You'll often hear me speak of how very dear God's Word is to us. Amen. When we just think about what we have here in God's Word, what He's given us here in His precious, precious Bible. This, is, this, is, this means that we have anchor for our souls. This means that we don't have to run around being buffeted by the raging waves of our time. But we can go and turn to His Word, to His will. And this will keep us safe and secure as His people. So this morning, as I come to you bringing God's Word, please bear in mind, I'm not coming with the opinion of man. I am coming here with God's revelation. That revelation that has held men and women, the hands of the saints throughout the ages, and kept their feet on a sure foundation. Things will shift. Uh, as we've come to see very recently, nations will shift, economies will shift, the times will shift, technology certainly will shift, but not so the Word of God. And this morning we come to open His Word. What a joy and delight that is. So let me take a moment to thank those of you that have been getting in touch with us. Uh, just really been very encouraging to me. Uh, just really supported the ministry. And uh, I thank you. I thank you. You know, it's good to encourage one another in the things of God. And so as I come and open His Word, it's, it's good for me to know that people are being touched and encouraged and inspired to carry on, keep on keeping on in the things of God. Now, many of our listeners don't tune into our YouTube channel. They get the audio directly. Uh, so to them, uh, they're not seeing me directly, but they're hearing me and I welcome all of you as well. We are excited to be opening God's Word and may His Spirit be with you today as deep cries out to deep. Let's not look at these things with our human minds and human intellect. Let's allow the Spirit of God to come and to interpret these things to us. Now this morning I'm going to turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 32. And you know we've been reading about contentment and I want to speak about a character in the Bible who was a man who was not very content and how his role and how God got hold of him and his role was defined and changed because God had to teach him the lesson of contentment and this didn't just happen in one way it happened through a series of events throughout his life this man's name was Jacob and this morning we're going to be turning to his word in Genesis chapter 32 and we're going to be reading an incident where he was wrestling with a stranger and who that stranger was and how things unfolded we're going to look at that a little bit more closely but I'm excited for where God is taking us because this is teaching us also about that wonderful lesson of contentment you think you've got it all until you've got contentment let's let's just have a look here Genesis chapter 32 and verse 22 the same night that he that's Jacob arose and took his two wives his two female servants and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had and Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Marvelous, marvelous word. Who was that stranger? Why, 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 why did he appear to him there and then? Many mysteries here, but we're going to have a closer look at these right now. Let me just say, as an introduction, you know, 
Jacob's life. We, we pick up somewhere right now in the middle of his life. There's still a lot more living to be done. But yet, a lot of living has been done already. And Jacob's got a, a backstory to his life. I, I, you know, I think if I, if I think of Jacob, the type of character and man he was, I don't think him and I would have been good mates at all. I, I don't think I would have enjoyed his company. I get the impression from his youth and growing up, he was a spoilt, entitled little brat. And he comes from a broken family. He comes from a family where uh, I think uh, even the parenting was dysfunctional. You know, his father Isaac and Rebecca, they, they had their favorites and they made no bones about it. The father preferred Esau and the mother preferred Jacob. And so this started uh, and inflamed that relationship between the two boys and as they grew up. And then just growing up, how Jacob stole, he became a deceiver, and he stole that uh, birthright and that blessing from his brother Esau. And I, and I think of how he stole that, and you, can you just imagine the family dynamics that were going on? Man, I, I tell you something, these were some strained relationships. Often I've read the Bible, and I thought to myself, you know, when you start getting later in the history of Israel, and you, and you think of how the northern kingdom went to war with the southern kingdom and you say but lord how could israel fight against herself these were brothers they came from the same father abraham you know, wow man you think just over here when it comes to jacob and esau they were a lot closer related than some of the uh, distant tribes and yet even within the same household we think today even of some of the arabs and the Palestinians, uh, we think of how they fight with the house of Israel. And yet they all claim to have the same father, Abraham. These are very involved, very complicated relationships. But we pray, praise be to God, we know that he is the reconciler of all things, even within the families. Well, Jacob's brother Esau was so wroth with him for stealing the birthright so wroth with him for stealing the blessing you see Esau understood the power of the blessing and how blessing could shift destinies it could shape fortunes it could bring about connections and prosperity and it could ward off evil he understood the power of the blessing that's why he was so very angry I believe we as a church need to get an understanding of the blessing again we just use it as a byword well bless you brother do we realize what we're actually saying to that brother? Does the brother realize what we're actually imparting into him? Bless you, brother. Something very, very powerful. Jacob stole the blessing from his brother. His brother was so wroth that he wanted to murder him. And he made no secret about it. So Jacob had to flee. He couldn't put up to the might. He couldn't stand up to the might of his brother. So he fled to the territory of his uncle Laban. Now, if you think Jacob was a deceiver... Laban was an even greater deceiver. He's a bit of a crooked chap. And it's amazing that his uncle deceived him. What you sow, you reap. And Jacob uh, wanted to work for seven years for his bride. But his uncle deceived him. And he got two for the price of one. No, he got two for the price of two. He had to work double the time. He worked 14 years for his uncle. And so we know that it could have been in excess of 14 years that he was actually under the service of his uncle 14 for the brides plus a little bit on the side as well now after having become a very wealthy and successful man god put onto jacob's heart he said jacob you need to go back to the land of your birth there's things that i need to deal with you i've dealt with you yeah and i needed to bring you to this environment to put into you the lessons that i've put into you yeah but now I need to take you to another environment because there's a whole world of new lessons and teachings that I need to do with you and dealings that I need to do with you. We, we, we must not be surprised when God changes our environment from time to time. There are times when God needs to move you so that he can deal with you differently in a different setting. So don't be surprised if God changes your location from time to time. I'm sure though, when God said to Jacob, listen, you need to go back to the land of your birth. That must have been a terrifying word. Remember, Jacob knew how he betrayed his brother. And this was, I believe, one of Jacob's greatest sins. One of those things that had plagued him for all those many years. It must have caught him. 
Remember, it wasn't Jacob's idea. It was actually his mother's idea that he deceive his brother. But he went along with it. He was all too willing to go along with it. And he deceived his brother. But now was the time of reckoning where the two brothers would come together. Jacob must have feared this time. Because now God was getting him to man up. God was getting him to face that thing. It's a wonderful time, brothers and sisters, when God gets us to man up. When God gets us to face those things that have been bothering us in the back of our minds. You mustn't let these things cripple you. Don't run ahead of God. Allow His Holy Spirit to lead you to that place. But I believe that there will be times. Now I know that when we come to God, we, we come to Him and God makes us a brand new creation. I understand that the old is gone and the new has come. But in God's economy there is also the matter of restoration and reconciliation as well. And the word says, where possible, I love that, it clarifies, because it's not always possible, but where possible, when it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. The Bible also speaks, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. It doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. Big difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. There are times in your life where God will send you back to go and make some peace. There's times. So Jacob was now facing this. He was getting ready to go and make peace again with his brother. And he knew that he was putting his life on the line. He understood that this could have cost him and his wife and wives and children all their lives because he understood the temper of his brother Esau and the might. Remember by now Esau had, had inherited all the men and all the wealth of his father Isaac. So he was a very wealthy man as well. God said to Jacob, he said, Jacob, go back. This is a tough time. This is a tough season. When God says to us, go back, go and sort it out, go and make it right. And listen, you go back and go try and make things right. If the other person responds well and loving, praise be to God, a relationship has been healed and restored. If not, your hands have been washed. At least you have been obedient to God. But don't run ahead of the Holy Spirit. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. It didn't take Jacob a day or two to do this. It took him in excess of 14 years before he went back to the place of his brother. So I just want to leave that thought with you. This is a bit of the backstory then where we're dealing and where we've picked up now. And we're told that in the same night... I love that word in the same night. It's, it sets context. It sets setting. We ask ourselves in the same night as what? Because all of this wrestling that we spoke of happened in the same night. The same night as what? The same night that Jacob's present passed on ahead of him. You see, Jacob divided all his spoil. He divided all his wealth. And he sent it on in separate droves ahead of him. Go and read that whole chapter for yourself fascinating how he had sent a gift ahead of him to go and meet with his brother Esau so he was softening his brother the same night that he sent the, the gift on ahead of him but where did he send the gift on ahead of him across the Jabbok River L let me just make a comment over here I love the fact that we can send treasures on ahead of us I love the fact. I, I, I want to bring in what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 uh, verses 19 and 20. You'll remember there Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in to steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves destroy. Do not break in or steal. So what Jesus is saying is saying, listen, there's a way that you can send things on ahead of you. There was a, a saying that's been stuck with me, man. It really impressed me. It said, you cannot take anything, anything with you when you die. You cannot. But you can send things on ahead of you. And this is what Jesus spoke of when he said, 
lay up treasures for yourselves in heaven just let me quickly go down a bit of a rabbit path over here because i want to bring up one of paul's writings in a similar vein paul the apostle wrote to timothy the young pastor in 1 timothy chapter 6 verses 17 to 19 he said as for the rich in this world so they had a mix in their congregation some very poor some very rich as well as for the rich in this present age charge them in other words timothy don't give them a choice don't come and say to them well i suggest or maybe or you know come on chaps come come encourage no charge them it's a strong word the rich don't give them a choice this is what i'm telling you to tell the rich charge them not to be haughty because people's riches can make them very haughty can give them a sense of uh, uh, inflated importance can give them a sense of false security no paul says charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches boy have we come to see how uncertain riches are hey within a night people's fortunes have been wiped out businesses shut down not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on god who richly provides us with everything to enjoy listen to what it says about god he richly provides us with things why just so that we can get by just so that we can eke out a living no he richly provides us with everything to enjoy god god treasures your enjoyment you know there's been this horrible heresy where it says god's not interested in your comfort but in your character mm, listen uh if you if that's your theology keep it not my theology I believe that your character is very important to God. Absolutely. But so is your enjoyment, your, in, uh, your ability to enjoy. As Paul wrote to Timothy, God gives us things to enjoy. Not just to sustain the practicalities of life, but to enjoy life. Gives us everything to, to enjoy. But then Paul carries on with the, with, about the rich. He says, they are to do good and to be rich in good works that's where true wealth is be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share right generous and in other words to the wealthy your money is not your own your wealth is not your own if, if you want to send it ahead of you be generous with it be ready to share with it thus here it is thus in this way if they are generous and ready to share if they do good deeds with what god has blessed them with thus in this way storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life so paul is just being practical here and he's showing th this is what i'm saying there have been times in my life where, you know you go through hey we sometimes the month to month is a little bit tighter eh? and you have this unexpected expense here or unexpected expense there the car needs a service medical expenses hey flu seasons hit hard the antibiotics and medicines and doctors visits you we all go through times like this and now you're sitting and you've got a choice because you realize that there's somebody that has a need and now you've got this money you think oh but it's been a tight oh lord you know i've just got this bit i'd like to spend on myself that i've salvaged you know what lord put on my heart warren you can keep it but if you do just know that the moth and the rust is going to get hold of that just know that it's liable to be stolen from you you say no lord instead of keeping it i'm going to send this ahead how do I send it ahead? By taking this and meeting this person's need. By taking this and being generous with this person. You may think you have very little, but let me tell you, there are many people that got far less than you. So here was Jacob doing everything that he could, everything that he knew in his mind, how to try and appease his brother. But look at the wonderful providence of God. God knew when God gave Jacob the order to go back home, God knew that Jacob would find himself here at the ford of the Jabbok River uh, in, in, in such turmoil. And God had already set the stage. God had already made provision for Jacob. God knew that this was going to come. And so what did God do? He sent a wonderful sign to Jacob beforehand. In verse 1 and verse 2 of this chapter, we read, Jacob went on his way 
and the angels of God met him. You see, Jacob was used to having encounters with angels. This, this that we read is at least the third time. Remember, there was the other time that he dreamt about the ladder, the stairway to heaven. But now before this encounter at the Jabbok River, God met him, or the angels of God met Jacob. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So, there, there was an earlier place with, with the, uh, the ladder where he dreamt about the ladder going up the stairway to heaven. You remember, he said, this is the house of God. He called that place Bethel, house of God. But now he said, this is the camp of God. And so, Jacob called that place Manahem. Now, Manahem basically means two camps. What did Jacob mean by two camps? He meant that here's my camp, I'm encamped here, and there's God's camp. Because there were two companies there. There was Jacob's company with him and his wives and children and uh, all that he owned, animals and servants. And uh, uh, there was also God's camp in the not too distant future. Manahem. Two camps. Jacob's small encampment of wives and children and servants and livestock. Listen to what we hear. They are being followed by and overshadowed by the camp of God. Manahem two camps was Jacob's way of saying wherever I go God is going with me there's not just one camp there's two camps there's not just me uh, it's not just about about me going to face Esau or me being afraid of myself they are two camps I want to tell you brother I want to tell you uh, sister fellow saint there's two camps Manahem over your situation I, I want to tell you uh, just just like the prophet said to his servant he said there are more for us than against us just like the prophet said he said there are the angels above the treetops oh God open his eyes that he can see it I want you to see that there are two camps you are not alone in the situation you may feel alone but there are two camps and I also believe that Jacob learned from this concept of dividing the camps, two camps, a strategy of how to handle and deal with his brother's approaching army. Two camps. No, let's not keep all of my family in one camp. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide my family. I'm going to split them up when, we, when they get to the other side of the Jabbok. And this indeed is what Jacob did. I believe that God was teaching Jacob how to prepare for the advancing army. Of his brother his brother was coming to meet him with more than 400 men that was quite a sizable army and now that Jacob had done all that he could and now that he had put all the plans into place listen he was still afraid he was still tossing and turning he found himself on this side of the Jabbok River now all alone and he was tossing and turning he had one of those restless nights eh? He, he, he had done everything. It just shows you, no matter how carefully you plan things, there's still going to be that knot in your stomach. No matter how carefully you put contingencies into place, no matter how much the wisdom, uh, even knowing that God is overshadowing you, sometimes you can still be afraid. Sometimes you can still be troubled. And here was Jacob still afraid. Here was Jacob still troubled. Couldn't sleep properly. Something was keeping him awake, and that was his mind. The Bible says that he was greatly afraid and distressed. This was, oh, have you ever been in a situation where you've been greatly afraid and distressed? Now, God has shown you what to do. He's put things into place. God has promised you that he's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God is there. He's promised all those things, and yet you're still greatly afraid and distressed. Oh, boy, we're but clay pots, eh? We, we're but like the reeds of the, the grasses of the fields, easily shaken. Even with all these wonderful truths that God has given to us, we still allow ourselves to become distressed and afraid. Jacob was in a very tight spot. Not, not only was he afraid of what was coming and advancing towards him, but remember, he was afraid of his uncle Laban. His uncle Laban had also at once pursued him with a sizable force and so Jacob couldn't go back to his uncle Laban in fact Jacob and his uncle had both taken vows that neither one would set foot in the other one's territory again wow talk about strained family relations here yeah they are they've actually taken a vow never again never again will I set foot in your property uh, sometimes we hear similar things it's the same spirit we say to a family a family member never set foot in my home again Wow, horrible.
evil spirit that man uh, and sometimes these things are justified i know i know relationships are complicated but oh boy so sad that things boil down to that so Jacob had made a vow that, and, and his uncle had made a vow they would never set foot in each other's territory. Here was Jacob stuck, stuck and alone at the ford of the Jabbok River. So he also couldn't sleep, tossing and turning. Sometimes tossing and turning is not always a bad thing. I want to give you a bit of advice. If you have those nights where you are distressed or upset or, or maybe just disturbed, vexed in your spirit for some reason or another, get up, man. Get up. That could be a little bit of a prompting of the Lord to say to you, I need to spend some time with you. You know, your, 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 your wife or your husband, your partner, uh, your, 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 your spouse is fast asleep. Your, your children are fast asleep. Get up. I need to spend time with you. If you've got things, if you believe in things like that, put your slippers on. If you believe in things like that, put your gown on. Go through to the living room. Be quiet in my presence. The cell phones are off right now. Computers off. Keep that TV off. And let me just spend some time with you. You may think to yourself after an encounter, well, I went and spent some time, but I didn't hear God, didn't get an impression, didn't get a Bible reading you would be surprised what the Lord has laid on your heart. It may take a few days to unfold, but you have received it. There are times when you're distressed in your spirit. Don't lie around in your bed tossing and turning. Get up. Arise. You need to realize when the time for sleep is over. Uh, like Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 5 verse 14, he says, Awake, O sleeper. Awake. The time for sleeping is over. You are disturbed in your spirit for a reason. And if you continue to sleep, you're going to miss a divine appointment. That, 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 that tossing and turning is actually a friend to you. It's actually an ally. It's getting you ready. It's like a chaperone. It's getting you ready to go and have a meeting with God. Get out of your bed and go and have a meeting with the Lord. And see what He's going to drop into your spirit at that time. See, when the Bible speaks about those who sleep, the idea is that their righteousness is not visibly evident. And therefore, the person appears to be no different to somebody that is unrighteous. So when the Bible speaks about somebody that's asleep, you're, you're saved, you're sanctified, but it's like something within your spirituality is dormant. And God needs that area to wake up. And there are times in life that we go through crisis, or there's times that our souls or spirits are distressed and we don't have the peace within us because God is saying hey wake up you've been dormant too long there's an area that I need you to minister uh, in and there's an area that I need to speak to you about come on man get out of bed there, there was a there was a time that Jesus said to his sleepy disciples he said remain here and watch with me remain here watch don't sleep watch I need you to be watchful I, I don't need you to sleep right now and later he said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. Sometimes you have this restlessness within you because the hour is at hand for you. What have you been praying for? What have you been trusting the Lord for? Where's the breakthrough? It's not a bad thing. And if you just sleep, I want to tell you, you may fall asleep later, but it's going to be a broken sleep. It's going to be a heavy sleep when you wake up in the morning. You're going to feel like you've gone 10 rounds with a champion boxer, man. You're going to feel beaten up. Whereas if you had to just get up and go get the deposit from the Most High God, you will realize what is at hand. The hour is at hand. Perhaps God is going to give you some sort of a warning. Perhaps God wants to give you some sort of a, uh, an instruction. Perhaps God wants to give you an encouragement. Perhaps God uh, wants you to lift and raise your vision. But I know one thing. God wants to spend time with you. Wake, O sleeper, go and spend time with the Lord. Now, many Christians are aware of some of the waters that we must cross. You know, when we speak about waters, we all know what we're talking about when we talk about waters. Eh? We have those storms in life. We've got those uh, raging waters. We've got those tranquil, quiet waters. We've got those waters that may seem peaceful on the top, but you know they're very deep, very treacherous underneath there as well we all know about those waters but some of the most significant waters that we speak about 
in Christianity and as we apply them to our Christianity would be for example the waters of the the Red Sea this was the 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 the, the first obstacle that the Israelites had to face after being set free and the waters of the Red Sea are symbolic to us of our salvation of how God set us free from slavery in Egypt and then we had to cross over the river into a new life we had to cross over the, the, the river into the wilderness area and so we cross over that and we pro cross over by the mighty hand of God himself but then we find ourselves in the wilderness and unfortunately this is where many children of God get stuck I've met so many Christians that are stuck in the wilderness you can see it because they've still got wilderness thinking wilderness thinking has to do with your warfare wilderness thinking has to do with your provision so firstly when you're stuck in the wilderness your warfare is always defensive because if you go look at the Israelites the enemy was always taking pot shots at them setting up ambushes at them man they, they, they were picking off the stragglers that were falling behind it was always defensive so you've constantly got to you, you know you've got to shield and guide and, and and this is how your warfare is when you're in the wilderness you're constantly staving off the attacks you're constantly trying to figure out why it is that so and so is doing such and such and that's that that's wilderness warfare your provision in the wilderness is manna you've got to go out and collect got to go and pick up which is not a bad thing it's God's hand for you praise God for manna but I'm, what I'm saying is there's a difference then when you cross the Jordan River now the Jordan is very different to the Red Sea when you cross the Jordan River then you leave the wilderness and you come into the promised land now many Christians are stuck in the wilderness because they're not even aware that there's a Jordan River so they cross the Jordan they go into the promised land what happens there well it impacts on your warfare impacts on your provision firstly your warfare changes because no longer are you defensive the Bible says that once the Israelites got into the promised land their warfare changed now their strategy became offensive now they had to go and take the land they were now the aggressors they were now the ones laying siege to the cities they were now the ones driving out those sinful wicked inhabitants of that land so your warfare changes you will see when you're in uh, the promised land you will see that your prayer life changes not so much are you sitting now waiting and saying, oh Lord when is when is the next one coming no now you're seeing it you're identifying the targets you're identifying the enemy and you're moving in and you're possessing secondly your provision changes no longer are you a collector that's what manna speaks of you go and collect but now you're a producer God has put you in a land of milk and honey he's put you in a fertile land and God blesses your ability to produce so two areas are changed when you cross the Jordan River but what about the Jabbok River what do we mean because if there's a f only a few Christians that realize about the crossing of the Jordan I want to tell you there's even fewer still that realize about the Jabbok uh, River the waters of the Jabbok so what do we mean when I speak about that the Jabbok River itself is a tributary of the Jordan uh, from the east and the Hebrew name Jabbok is derived either from the sound that comes from the water that runs over the pebbles or it means to empty get this to empty one's self to empty one's self remember Jacob had to send his wife his family and all his possessions across the Jabbok River and when he had emptied himself and only when he had emptied himself did he have a divine encounter on a different level only once he had emptied himself did he come to this place where he had a wrestling match with an angel of God and this is a very important juncture this is a very important time for Christians to go through some people never have this encounter and for that reason the blessing 
that is spoken of here is never released over their life now they may have other blessings but this blessing in particular is never released over their life I, I, I think about it Jacob was where he was why because he stole the blessing the birthright blessing from his brother and yet here he was demanding from the one that he was wrestling he said, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me why because the blessing was different I'm about to share a very powerful spiritual principle with you but our time has run out so we don't have any time to get into it right now but I am so excited for what God wants to lay on your heart what God wants to share with you as he's been sharing with me from his word and we're going to do that as I share the principle of the Jabbok blessing with you can't wait to tune in again as we meet next week <music>